The use of the ophthalmoscope is an important tool in making a clinical diagnosis beyond the realms of ophthalmoscopy. Examination of the eyes, especially the fundus, is important as it may reveal signs of pathology in many systems such as endocrine, neurological, cardiovascular, as well as being a useful tool in general medicine. With the ophthalmoscope, you can examine many features, but of particular importance is the posterior part of the eye or the fundus. It includes the retina, the optic disc, the macula and fovea, the choroid layer, and blood vessels. There are two types of ophthalmoscopes, direct and indirect. The indirect is used to examine the entire retina. Here we will be discussing direct ophthalmoscopy. The direct ophthalmoscope is a handheld instrument useful for examining the central part of the retina. It consists of two components, a handle and a head. The handle normally houses the batteries. The head contains a light source and a view hole through which you can rotate a series of convex and concave lenses. The lenses are numbered in diopters. Usually, the convex lenses are labeled with black numbers which signify positive diopters. In the opposite direction, the numbers labeled in red signified lenses with negative diopters. Generally, positive diopters are used to visualize the anterior segments of the eye and the negative diopters to examine posterior segments. In addition to single diopter steps, most ophthalmoscopes have a dial which enables you to change by plus or minus 10 diopters in a single step. A filter disc is usually situated on the rear face. The normal wide beam is used for general examination purposes. A narrow beam can be used for examining the optic disc or if the pupils are very constricted. There is also a green light or, as it should be referred to, a red-free filter. It enhances blood vessels and hemorrhages and helps to differentiate blood pigmentation from hemorrhages. There is also a grid which is used for mapping out the position of any lesion. A slit-like beam is sometimes used to assess elevations or concavities on the retina. The strength of the beam can be adjusted with a rheostat control on the handle. When examining a normal or a metropic eye, the image is magnified 15 times. This occurs because the cornea and the lens of the eye themselves act as magnifiers. The choice of lens you will need to establish a clear image will depend on your distance from the patient as well as any focusing errors from your eyes and the patient eyes. Take into consideration that the size of the patient pupils may be influenced by a number of factors, but especially medications. If the use of mitriatic drops are required, then ensure that they are not contraindicated for that patient. Explain to them that they will become photosensitive and for this period they should not drive. The drops are normally applied 15 to 20 minutes before the examination. Ensure that both you and the patient are in a comfortable position with your eyes at the same level and at about one meter away from each other. Ask the patient to remove their spectacles. Contact lenses do not need to be removed unless they are tinted. You can keep your own spectacles on or remove them as required. If you do remove your own spectacles, you will need to compensate for this by changing the diopters accordingly. A simple way of adjusting the ophthalmoscope to your own vision is to look at the small writing on the Snellen chart and adjust the lenses until it comes into focus. Each line on the Snellen chart is usually labeled with a number. This signifies the distance in meters or feet at which it should be clearly visible with the normal vision. The lights should be dimmed to allow for better pupil dilation and to improve focusing contrast. It is recommended that when you examine the patient's right eye, you hold your thermoscope with your right hand, look with your right eye and vice versa. This allows you to get as close to the patient as needed because both yours and the patient's noses are not in the way. The closer you get to the patient, the better, as the closer you are, the wider your field of vision will be, just like looking through a keyhole. It is advisable to keep your other eye open during the examination. 
Some practitioners prefer to steady their patient's head by placing their hand on their forehead. In fact, students are advised to hold the patient's head with their thumb placed over the patient's eyebrow. This prevents excessive blinking by the patient, but also stops you from touching their eye in the event you get too close. If you need to do this, ensure that you have the patient's permission before doing so. Instruct the patient to look slightly laterally to your head or over your shoulder and to focus their gaze into the distance, preferably on an object on the wall. You may wish to examine first the external features of the eye, including the eyelashes, the lid margins, the sclera and conjunctivi. Begin at arm's length using the widest beam. Set the diopter to zero or at the setting you established when it was calibrated for your vision. Throughout the examination, hold the handle slightly to one side, away from the patient's face, and keep your index finger on the wheel of the lens, so that lenses can be changed easily. Begin examining with your eye level with theirs at about 10 to 15 centimeters away and slightly lateral to the line of vision. This is approximately 15 degrees laterally. Shine the beam into the pupil and look for a reddish glow. This is known as the red reflex which means that you are now looking at the patient's retina. If you are unable to see the red reflex, the lens may be opaque, such as with a cataract, and in such cases, you may be unable to complete the examination. It may also be absent in some cases of retinal detachment, or when there is a hemorrhage into the vitreous body, and rarely with floaters, scars, or corneal lesions. Slowly move closer to the patient. At the same time, gradually reduce the power of the diopter lens whilst examining the cornea, the lens, the vitreous body, and then the fundus until you're about two inches away from their eye. The power of the lens needed to focus on the fundus will vary with each patient. By adjusting the lenses one step at a time, you will be able to locate and focus onto a blood vessel on the fundus. Arteries are smaller and brighter than the larger, darker veins. Then focus on a vessel and trace its path to the point where other vessels are also converging. This is the optic disc, the part of the eye where the retinal vessels and the optic nerve emerge. Evaluate the size and color of the optic disc. The margins should be sharp and well defined. Then attempt to identify the optic cup. This is a white depression located in the center of the disc from where the blood vessels emerge. The optic disc is normally a creamy pink to yellow-orange color and with clear borders. Note the margins. If they are not easy to distinguish, the cup is not visible and there are dilated retinal veins, then these may be signs of papilledema. This may be caused by increased intracranial pressure, severe hypertension, meningitis, trauma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or acute optic neuritis. A pale disc may indicate multiple sclerosis, optic nerve compression, or it may occur after optic neuritis. If the cup is enlarged and the rim is diminished, then this may be a sign of glaucoma. Next, examine the blood vessels in all four quadrants. Check for signs of hypertensive or arteriosclerotic retinopathy. The red free filter may help make small aneurysms and hemorrhages stand out easier. With hypertension, the arteries may be narrowed to about half the size of the veins and appear brighter than normal. This is known as copper or silver wiring effect. Also, where arteries and veins meet, look for nipping or narrowing of the vein at that point. This is another common finding in patients with hypertension. New fronts of blood vessels emanating from the disc are associated with ischemic diabetic retinopathy. The retina should be of uniform color and free from scars or pigmentation. Note any lesions such as soft white patches known as cotton wool spots or exudates. These may be signs of diabetes, hypertension, vasculitis or HIV. Shiny yellow circumscribed patches are hard exudates of lipids. These are often seen in diabetics. Larger round blots are hemorrhages deep in the retina 
and may be caused by diabetes. Flame-shaped superficial hemorrhages along nerve fibers are signs of hypertension, gross anemia, hyperviscosity, or a bleeding diathetesis. Formation of peripheral new vessels are signs of ischemic diabetic retinopathy or from retinal vein occlusion. Then examine the peripheral margins of the fundus by getting the patient to look in different directions or by changing your angle of view. Finally, examine the macula. This is the area of central vision with a high concentration of cones for fine vision and for color recognition. It is located lateral to the optic disc. Ask the patient to look directly at the light. Alternatively, focus laterally to the optic disc. It is recommended that you re-examine the macula under the red free filter. The macula appears as a darker structure free of blood vessels. If the macula is pale, it may signify a pathology. Macular degeneration is a common cause of poor central vision in the elderly. Record your findings and then repeat your examination on the other eye. A more accurate method of recording the location of any lesion is using a fundus chart. The optic disc is depicted by the center of the chart. If you locate an abnormality, continue looking for any others. To memorize the examination, adopt a logical routine which begins from the external features of the eyes, then the red reflex, the anterior structures, the vitreous body, the optic disc, the retina and blood vessels, and lastly, the macula. Now let us explain the use of the otoscope. Together with the ophthalmoscope, it makes up the diagnostic kit. The handle may be the same as that of the ophthalmoscope, and this normally houses the power source. The head is simple, consisting of a light source, a magnifying lens, and an exchangeable earpiece or speculum. Depending on your otoscope, the earpieces may be disposable, or if reusable, they require sterilizing before each use. These come in various sizes. Examination of the ear should always include inspection of the external ear and the mastoid processes. Note any redness or lesions. Before inserting the speculum into the ear, explain the procedure to the patient and inform them that it may be uncomfortable but not painful. The best position to perform the examination is with the patient sitting. Select the largest earpiece that you can fit comfortably into the ear canal. Small earpieces limit the amount of vision. Always examine the good ear first to prevent the spread of infection into the unaffected ear. If you are examining the right ear, hold the otoscope with your right hand and conversely the opposite for the other ear. There are two methods of holding the otoscope, the hammer grip and the pencil grip. Students initially tend to prefer the hammer grip as it feels more normal, but this has its disadvantages. With the hammer grip, you will find you have less control. You may also exert unnecessary force on the skin of the ear canal and cause pain to the patient. For these reasons, the pencil grip may be considered safer for the trainee. Holding the otoscope nearer to the earpiece rather than at the end of the handle will limit the amount of movement translated to the speculum when moving your hand. It is therefore preferable for the trainee. Turn the light source up to full and to help you straighten the external canal with your free hand gently pull the pinna superiorly and posteriorly. This process may not be needed when examining small children as the canal is straighter. Take care not to exert too much pressure onto the sensitive walls of the ear canal. Due to the angle of the external ear canal, you will need to angle the speculum slightly anteriorly towards the patient's nose. Do not insert the speculum too far to avoid damaging the eardrum. You should still be able to visualize the eardrum as the light extends beyond the tip of the speculum. Initially examine the external canal walls. The canal is normally skin colored with small hairs and usually some earwax. Check all surfaces in all angles for any inflammation, redness, exudates like pus or blood, and excess buildup of wax. 
whilst continuing to lift the ear, slowly progress into the canal and try to identify the eardrum. The normal tympanic membrane is a semi-transparent, slightly curved, cone-shaped structure. Next, identify the handle of the malleus, which lies on the deep surface of the tympanic membrane. The light source of the otoscope reflects off the surface of the tympanic membrane in a cone of light in the direction of the angle of the mandible. This is known as the light reflex of the eardrum. In an abnormal tympanic membrane, this light reflex is dull or absent. Inspect all areas of the tympanic membrane and identify all anatomical structures. Note down the presence or absence of any scars or perforations. Identify the color of the tympanic membrane. If it is dull red, it usually indicates fluid in the middle ear. If the patient has middle ear infusion, then occasionally you will see fluid bubbles or an amber liquid deep to the tympanic membrane. Note any white colored scars on the surface of the membrane that may be a result from previous infections or from the use of grommets. Redness and inflammation or bulging of the tympanic membrane indicates an infection. If blood vessels are visible through the tympanic membrane, you may be in fact be looking at the mucosa of the middle ear. In this instance, the tympanic membrane is perforated. If you suspect infection, then when holding the pinna, rotate it gently and ask the patient if this provoked undue pain. Now, Mr. Fox, I'm going to tap at your ear gently. Tell me if this is um, unduly painful. No, it's fine. Okay, thank you. On completion of the examination, ensure that you have removed the speculum for disposal or sterilization.